I want to say hello to these two women who regularly enter a lot of your living rooms. Chandra Wilson, who plays Dr. Miranda Bailey, uh, Chief Miranda Bailey, and Kelly McCreary, Grace Sloan Zone, Dr. Maggie Pierce. Let's just start off with discussing the scene in episode 1705. I don't want her to suffer from this Alzheimer's anymore. You know, it's a horrific disease and I want her to be free. But I don't want COVID to be the reason. I, I don't want her to be just another black woman statistic in this pandemic count. Since I wrote that episode, that came from like my experiences and my friends' stories. So I would love for you guys to tell me anything that sticks out for you about growing up as Nina Simone sings, young, gifted, and black. Certainly on the actor end of it, when you are given a script and you have a scene that's an act, um, <laughs> you want to make sure that this act is earned, right? Like this is an earned place, especially because of the subject matter and us being a vehicle for people to grieve at, at that time during, at, at that point in the COVID journey. We hadn't had a national day of mourning yet. We hadn't had, you know, like a national acknowledgement of, of the losses that have uh, been occurring during the pandemic. So I understood the need to facilitate that and to be able to give a conversation to and to our audiences that maybe they aren't having, right? That they don't know that as black women, as black children, as black physicians, that these are conversations that we have. What you said about it being uh, the scene needing to be earned. And our audience needed to want to know that perspective from us, right? And I think that like every, all the work that we did in that episode led up to that moment. And also for these characters, you know, I've been thinking a lot about how Maggie was a prodigy and she was very likely, not necessarily, but very likely um, one of the only or one of the few um, black girls, kids, people, um, you know, in almost every scenario she was in growing up. Um, yeah. And, you know, when I think about m my upbringing, that was true too, but you know, I was reminded of the, the part of um, Michelle Obama's book, Becoming, where she talks about how, you know, her, if not for her mother intervening with her teacher, she to make sure that she, you know, was in the right um, level, you know, learning level in her classroom, she may have been left behind. Her talent may not have been identified. And I think a lot about having been identified as a young, gifted, black, talented kid and how that was how I was sort of separated and isolated, you know, I was um, into these sort of specialized groups, right? Like the, the gifted and talented program. And, 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 and in those spaces, I was one of um, few, if not the only black kids. And yet the kids who were um, my same age group who were not in those groups, I'm, I'm sure that they had talent and ambition and intelligence that just wasn't identified, you know? And so as a kid, I was isolated from those kids that I wasn't that different from. And I, I felt, I did, I, I sort of learned to feel different from them. And so I'll bring that back to that scene with Maggie and Bailey. It's like, you know, for maybe for a long time in her life, Maggie was thought of herself as the only she was maybe in a lot of those spaces and finally there's somebody else here sharing the space um who is also a black woman who has achieved a lot and is is has probably faced a lot of the same struggles and here they finally finally have this chance to um get to know the ways in which their their journeys may have been similar or different 
uh, Wellesley. It's a fine school, Miranda, but um, I think state school is more your speed. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know my speed, please. Try harder and do better just to be considered average. Or to be considered at all. But how they underestimate our greatness. The reason I really wanted to write that scene is because of 17 seasons, these women have not gotten together and we have not been able to just talk about our journeys. And I felt like kind of after the racial reckoning happened, I mean, you know, it's always happening, but after yeah. other people realized it was happening, there seemed to be a lot of sharing on social media and a lot of my friends and colleagues and people I had grown up with were sharing their stories. And you could just see how similar they were to your stories. And I was like, this is a collective thing that no one has been saying and no one has been talking about that people need to know. Like we're just kind of, we are used to it and we are in our existence, but other people don't know. And it, it reminds me of this time in college um, where um, I was in a black dance group and I, I invited one of my white friends to come. And she, afterwards she was like, I really loved it, but it was so weird being one of the only white people there. And that always just stuck with me. Um, and I was like, it's so little, it's, it, you know, now I know it was a microaggression that she didn't even know she was doing, but it was like every single day I walk into a classroom where I am the only black person. Yeah. I walk into cafeterias yeah. where I am the only black person. Why is that such a phenomenon for you, you know? Well, I think that that has been part of the reckoning. I, if, if, I can't think of a better word for it, right? That's been happening in, in 2020 is um, when we talk about privilege, right? And having to reconcile with the fact that you, you have as like as a white person been living with privileges that you didn't even know you had I had a conversation with a friend of mine one time that says when you wake up in the morning she was white and, and you look in the mirror you don't look in the mirror and say oh i'm white you know you, you go on about your day and you get out and you go on about your day right but for you know for black folks not that i wake up and look in the mirror and say i'm black but the minute i step outside i know it we have always done an amazing job i i, I I really celebrate our show because we have never had to or felt the need to slap people over the face with race. We have just been. Grace was kind of revolutionary and political without, as you said, say, you know, hitting people over the head with it, just by having um, people of color in the positions that they did and and not just the positions in the hospital but the roles on the show right like you have a, a black man who is a love interest to an asian woman you have you know a latina woman who is uh, is bisexual the way that we have um told the story the characters stories over the years has and it just been sort of inherently um culture shifting we am patting <laughs> patting us too much on the back but i think that it has shifted the culture enough so that we are we're primed for more advanced conversations like the ones that we're having now and without fear of showing sides of it that may not be the popular side the side of it that may not even be the side that we agree with. And that's your challenge, right? In that room, Zillian, is just to make sure that, ooh, I don't wanna really say this, but yeah, that's that's valid too. Like you were talking about with the scene, about earning that scene. I think, I feel like we've earned our place in talking about this now. You know, like we, mm. we pushed the boundaries 17 years ago. As our show has progressed and as culture has changed and has, as the years have gone on and the millennials have come, um, we are pushing the boundaries again. And it's just a complete, it's an evolution. It's a pushing forward. It's a moving. And, you know, now, now it's, is it enough to just have those characters be those characters? Or are we going to identify with their experience? It's really interesting to me. And I think a lot of people know this, um, that, you know, in the pilot, the only person who was uh, given a race and description really was um, 
the character of Miranda Bailey, <laughs> who was described as a tiny blonde with curls who was underestimated. But you stole the role with your audition because you were given that chance. And then Kelly, you're playing a mixed woman, but you're not like the typical light-skinned, uh, light-eyed actress. What's interesting is that, you know, both of my parents, are, I'm black. Both of my parents are black. My, um, I, I'm, I am the light-skinned one in my family. And, and everyone else in my family has a darker complexion than I do. Um, and I do wonder, you know, and frankly, the, the role I played right before Maggie Pierce was a mixed girl, uh, biracial, black and white. Uh, most of the auditions that I got were for mixed girls, right? So I'm, I'm a black woman. And because of my complexion, I was mostly going in to play mixed girls. These are roles that I wouldn't have been able to audition for and book possibly if my complexion had been darker. That's a sort of, I, I feel like kind of weird anomaly to my career, but at the same time, it's like, that that's my light skin privilege, you know? <laughs> that's, that's my light skin privilege is that I'm getting jobs. Just the fact that I came into the Grey's Anatomy audition at all, because I wasn't, um, ingenue right i didn't have whatever that look was and casting always likes to give you a type right so i was you know short and you know black and you know features was whatever what so i was never like going to be in the chorus all the way because i wasn't going to fit the chorus line and i wasn't going to be the ingenue so i was always the thing that they called non-traditional casting right you so i would just go in for anything and just say, I know that the role says this, but let me show you how I would do this and see if that's okay. That like, that's always been the, the case for me. I already knew I didn't fit in. So I, I just never cared. You just did the work. I just, yeah, I was just like, this is, I know you're looking for her, but here, how about this? Since we're talking about the industry, let's go on and talk about um, how you believe the industry is changing, hopefully for the better. So a lot of material historically comes to black actresses that um, aren't written by folks that are black and can't really speak from uh, introspectively. That doesn't mean that the only people that can write for black folks are black folks. I'm not saying that at all. I make that my responsibility, right, as an actor to take the material that I'm given and say, okay, I see this, I see where they're going. All right, let me then add the stuff that's missing. I, I just don't spend a lot of time fussing about um, a writer not seeing me. I turn around and make that character seen. For me, you know, I, I grew up in predominantly white spaces. And so everywhere I went, it was, you know, not going to be, you know, a culturally black experience, but I'm there and I'm black. So black people do it. It's black, right? <laughs> so, so, and, 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 you know, I think that's uh, the, sim the similar way that I've, I've always approached the material, right? Like it's like the character, if I'm going in for it, if I'm reading it, whatever is there on the page is black because I'm black. So, you know, and this right. is, this is, this can be black too. There isn't necessarily. You don't need don't to be to more black. How, yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't, there are no dials of blackness that I have to turn, even though I have been asked, can you make it more urban? Can you make it more, you know, can you be more black? Things like that in the past, not anytime recently, fortunately, but. Um, oh, so that's progress. For me, what's changing and what I feel, feel like is also reflected in the industry is that I just, the stories, stories are different when we tell them from our perspective. They just are. And I, I, I have, you know, I, I crave that. I crave the nutrition of, in, of you know, uh, stories from our perspective in my cultural diet. Like that's, that's what I want to see more of. And I do think that there has been more and more and more space opening up for creators and storytellers um, of color specifically black storytellers to come in and do things their way. And what I also love about it is that 
it doesn't have to be for every single one of us because we're getting to a place where there's such a volume of it that we can do niche stuff too, you know? And, and you know, and, and I love that. And I feel like that's allowing for our artistry to really, really thrive. The higher volume of, 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 of creativity that we get, the more space there is for all of it. One of the, the, ideas we were sort of tossing around about, you know, bringing up in this conversation was the historical figures that have inspired me. And, and thinking of that, I thought about like just the Harlem Renaissance generally, the Harlem Renaissance being like a time when a cohort of artists got together and made stuff and hung out and exchanged ideas. And I feel like you know, there have always, this, it's not like there was a Harlem Renaissance and now there's another, a new Renaissance and there was nothing in the meantime. There have always been those, those pockets of um, creative communities along the way. And, and I feel like right now what's growing and transforming in, in Hollywood and in these, and off of Hollywood, right? And all these platforms where people are creating these, these spaces is that there are these, com um, communities of creatives who are making things together and 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 sharing ideas about uh, our culture and our relationship to mainstream culture and and that are just i'm just i'm loving it i'm i'm thrilled by it it, it is so exciting to me coming from houston i grew up with my mom constantly pointing Debbie Allen out to me and I remember like in 77 I think it's when it was um West Side Story the tour uh came to town and that was one of the first times that I saw Debbie and I was one of those people that was like I think I'm gonna do something with Debbie Allen one day and I don't know what it's gonna be but like I was right there watching fame with everybody else and when Different World came out I knew I was gonna be in Different World at some point I was just waiting for my audition but when she finally did come to Grace it was as a director and her first episode was the episode after mine so I basically met Debbie with her coming to shadow me and I didn't need anything I didn't need an audition I, I, I didn't I you, you, and it was something that had never occurred to me that that would have been the circumstances that that relationship would have happened. Like I, I didn't need to do my kickball change. I just, all I had to do was just be there and she was coming to watch me. And that was crazy town. Earlier you were talking about the mirror and looking at yourself and then realizing I have to face the world as a black woman. And I remember a conversation that I had with you, Chandra, I think even before my son was born and it was about raising your son and telling him he couldn't hang out with his white friends and he had to impose, you had to impose a different set of standards, I think even um, from your girls, you know, it's like a whole new ball game. So even as successful celebrities, you still go through life as black women with husbands and sons and fathers. Um, can you talk about your, your connection to this country as a black woman and how complicated it is. It's an interesting conversation I should probably have with him now that he's 15, if he ever felt like he was stopped from doing things or if it just never presented. I, I never wanted to put that as a negative, but me watching this saying, if my child, you know, cause we would see little white boys walking up and down the neighborhood. And I said, if my son was in the middle of that, walking up and down the neighborhood, it might be, it's going to be a different experience for him. And I'm not ready for him to be in that position yet because it's gonna come, you know, at some point. I, I don't want him to be in that position now. Um, and I, I didn't worry about that with my girls. You know, we were, you know, in New York, full, you, you just outside, you jump on the train, whatever, that's New York. I, but I really felt it different. Um, you know, like being in a, a neighborhood situation or, or a suburb, suburb situation. I hate the fact that we still have to have these conversations with our kids. I hate the fact that it, um, even with Bailey having to do the talk with her son, I hate the fact that that's necessary. I hate that 
because somewhere in there I feel like I'm taking innocence away right like I'm 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 taking away your ability to just be a kid because I have to make you aware of the world that we live in so am I at am I perpetuating the thing more than what society is or am I being responsible like I have that conversation all the time who's doing more damage the world or me for getting you prepared for the world I think I mean, looking back now I, I didn't have this awareness then but I really did want to buy into the narrative as a child that like the civil rights movement healed everything and Martin Luther King yeah. did it and everything's great and now we can colorblind living say what colorblind living yes yeah you know? yeah and so for me, it's been like this, this tension between my personal experience of not feeling like I personally struggle with the reality that my people in this country, you know, my community has very unique, um, uh, unique to us, uh, um, difficulties of making our way and, and achieving this American dream that is supposed to, supposed to be accessible to all of us and that the, our, our reading of the history in this country being completely, um, uh, it, 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 it leaves out so much, it elevates things without you know balancing them out with some truths about those people or situations and and you know th that has done such a harm to the narrative of what we even think of as possible for us um and and so i i you know the more and more and more that i read about, study about, like, what's really, you know, what that struggle really, what it was, what it continues to be for us, the, the more tension I feel, again, through, uh, to, in my relationship to this country. Complicated is the best way to, to describe it, so, and I think that's what you said earlier. We built this place, you know, and yet I don't even know when I say we, I, I don't know who my ancestors were, you know, I don't know their names. I don't know where they lived. That that has been completely erased. Um, yes. But you know that they endured and they persevered and they struggled. Yes, yes. And they, 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 they did the really hard work to build this thing that I get to benefit from. And yet we still struggle, you know, we still are, are enduring in this struggle, you know, and 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 that i i i hated that i hated thinking about like why do our lives have to be a struggle can't we just like enjoy life but like there are systems <laughs> built in this country for meant for us to have to struggle against but you're right it would be nice to say that oh i'm at a oh we're at a place where it's done it's finally done and it would be nice to see when that is even in my son's history class you know right now we're talking about you know coming from let's say 1619 but earlier than that 1619 to you know 1865 enslaved it still hasn't been that long since we haven't been and no the civil rights movement didn't end it like we're not we're still not there we're still we're still having to be you know to work to get there but something that I know really resonated in my son's head is wow we've been here a long time and we're just as entitled because we did the building. We were the free labor that allowed the country to grow economically and internationally the way it did. And that was, it was really interesting to see him. Your son that realized that. Yeah, because because you're right, Kel, we don't have a past. We don't have, we don't have anybody to point to. We don't, you know, Africa is really big. Where in Africa? Like we don't have that to reach you. Our stuff is right here, this is our sort, this is our foundation. Um, uh, and to be able to own that, right, helps hopefully going forward in, in lessening that entitlement a little bit that folks don't think we have. We are just as entitled, we belong, right? This is ours, we did build it. Speaking of your, your son and the next generation, I mean, that gives me some hope. Um, yeah. Given that, given that, you know, we see something else in the news like every day. Like, how do you guys keep your mental health in check and what gives you hope? I hope this doesn't sound corny, but like, 
<laughs> Amanda Gorman. <laughs> I mean, and not just like obviously her herself, you know, this, but it's this idea of, of these bright, young, self-possessed people who like your son, Chandra, you know, they are, they are processing history um, in this, in the context of this moment, you know, they're con uh, processing, processing the context of the, the history of this country, of our struggle. And, yeah. and um, they have such an amazing ability to understand and process and activate that information into art into activism into um and, and and art and activism that's completely integrated into their lives the biggest place of hope for me right now is i i i, I want to believe that people are listening and people are paying attention there, there was a time when it was necessary to yell and then i got to a point this summer where i said you know what no let me let me dial it back and listen and hear i want to hear everything and and as long as we keep our minds opened enough to hear even if we don't understand there's empathy empathy can live in there somewhere and we can we can heal things that we didn't even know some of us didn't even know are broken right uh but that only comes from from being able to listen hopefully you yeah. know like mm -hmm. our show is is giving people hope yeah uh, hopefully gray's anatomy is uh by addressing our humanity and acknowledging us as in our experiences and living our lives as black women and black people that we are somehow giving um, some inspiration to that those young people, because there's a ton of young people that watch. Uh, mm -hmm. Over and over move again, on. by the way. And, <laughs> yeah. And and there's the older people who who also need to hear it. So, yeah. you know, hopefully in, in some way that our show is also doing that. And I thank you guys. This has been so great. We should just do this all the time. I know. Let's <laughs> yeah. I'm on my way to the lot. We could just continue this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need all these cameras. Like, click over to your phone and let's talk in the car. <laughs> <laughs>